So hello, everyone. Let me start off by thanking the League of Women Voters for inviting me to come and speak today, and uh, also thanking all of you for coming out to listen to what may be a relatively dry topic, but hopefully I can inject a little bit of interest uh, into it. So uh, as somebody who grew up in Topeka, I remember the library before it was the current building, um, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to be back here. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether I know anybody from high school that's out here in the, in, in the audience, and it, it, it may be possible. Am I? Uh, okay. Usually I talk too loud. So everybody hearing me okay? Um, all right. So the, the topic that uh, I will be discussing today is how we should interpret the Constitution. And my goal would be to just provide context for you to understand how controversies about the proper interpretive methods for the Constitution turn out to result in outcomes in controversial Supreme Court decisions. So the methods of interpretation contribute to the results that we see uh, on the Supreme Court in significant ways. And Ideally, uh, you won't know too much about what I actually think, and all I'm going to be doing is providing information for you that you can use yourselves to make uh, and assess uh, these issues. So uh, without any further ado, let me see if this is working. It's not. How about this one? There we go. So let's just start by thinking about the Constitution as a document. So the, the US Constitution is really unique among constitutions around the world in how short it is and how durable it is. So the entire constitution consists of seven articles um, which were written on one sheet of parchment when it was originally produced. There have been a number of amendments since then but the amendments are just tacked on to the end. So the original seven articles are still in the same form that they were as originally adopted. And the basic core of the constitution, the structure of government that it creates has not been changed since 1789. And that's really quite different from what we see in other countries where constitutions are frequently changed, sometimes radically, and are often extraordinarily long and detailed and complicated. They have hundreds of articles in them. They stretch over dozens and dozens of pages. Uh, they are revised and amended in significant ways on an ongoing basis. So that's a unique feature of our system to begin with. Now, uh, if you're gonna have a constitution like that, that's a reflection of the original understanding that the Constitution would be adaptable over time. So it wasn't written as a document that had detailed, specific rules for the structure of government. It laid out the general outlines of government. And then uh, uh, the assumption was that it would be implemented, adjusted, altered over time. Um, nonetheless, the Constitution does operate as law. So it's not just a political document. It's not just an agreement among the member states of the United States. It's, uh, it is itself a legal text that has binding consequences. So it imposes binding obligations on the government and on government officials. Um, it's enforced by courts as law in ordinary disputes that arise between private parties or between individuals in the government. Um, and because the Constitution is fundamental law and superior to all other kinds of laws in the United States, it empowers the courts to declare the actions of the president or the actions of Congress to be unconstitutional. If the courts are uh, confronted with a statute that is inconsistent with the Constitution, the duty of the courts is to apply the Constitution and not the statute. And that's generally referred to as the power of judicial review. So that's why 
uh, on an uh, sort of almost daily basis. We see news accounts and discussions of the Supreme Court, leading Supreme Court decisions, questions about things like abortion, same-sex marriage, environmental protection and safety, student loan forgiveness, any host of, uh, of things come before the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court is deciding whether or not they're consistent with the legal requirements of the Constitution. Now, it follows then that we have to interpret the language and text of the Constitution in order to apply it. Um, so uh, there are some provisions of the Constitution that are pretty clear and specific that don't need much interpretation. For example, the Constitution says that the president must be at least 35 years old. That's not really open for much debate. I've actually heard some people suggest, well, maybe we should use emotional age rather than chronological age. Um, uh, but generally, it's understood that's its chronological age. Um, if we used emotional age, then I'm not sure how many presidents would actually be qualified. So we'll leave that one to, to one side. But there are lots of provisions in the Constitution that don't have any clear and obvious meaning. Um, the, the Constitution says that Congress can regulate commerce among the states. What does that mean? And in addition, Congress can enact laws that are necessary and proper for the regulation of commerce among the states. We don't know exactly what that means. That requires interpretation. The uh, 14th Amendment says that no state can deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. We might be pretty clear about what life is, but liberty is a pretty vast and open-ended concept that has to be defined and given meaning. And same with due process of law. What does that mean? How do we define and apply that? The 14th Amendment also provides that states can't deny any person equal protection of the laws. But what does equal protection of the laws mean? That's not clearly defined. That has to be given meaning over, over time. So it falls to the Supreme Court and the lower courts in their capacity um, as uh, arbiters of legal disputes to give meaning to these open-ended constitutional uh, provisions. Another problem that uh, sort of necessitates interpretation is the world has changed a little bit since 1789. Um, uh, and so some concepts have to be adapted and made applicable in the current climate. So for example, the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. How do you decide what that means when we're talking about a cell phone and whether you can search a cell phone's contents or whether you can listen in on somebody's cell phone conversation through uh, some sort of interception uh, device, right? There's nothing that in the in the Constitution itself that tells us this. And we can't really imagine that the framers, they were pretty foresighted, but they didn't understand what cell phones were going to look like. And they didn't think about how the Fourth Amendment would apply to cell phones. Um, so courts are stuck with these open-ended provisions and a changing world, and they have to give meaning. Um, in the context of real life, modern circumstances, and decide and resolve disputes by applying the Constitution as the fundamental law of the country. Um, and uh, at the center of current debates about the Constitution uh, is the proper method for interpreting its provisions. Um, and broadly speaking, we can kind of divide the interpretive approaches that justices and judges uses excuse me, use in into two broad uh, categories. So uh, one category is what I would call conceptual evolution. Um, that's based on the idea that these broad sweeping terms of the Constitution reflect certain core values and the op obligation of the courts would be to identify those values and try to further them as you apply the broad provisions of the Constitution in any particular case. The countervailing approach is usually referred to as originalism. Um, and, and that approach says the proper 
uh, a way to interpret the Constitution is to search for the understanding of the text as it was adopted at the time it was adopted. So the goal is to identify what the framers and the founders of the country understood the terms of the Constitution to mean in 1789, or if we're talking about the 14th Amendment in the 1860s and 70s, what did they understand these provisions to mean? Um, and what I wanna do in the rest of my talk is highlight the differences between these two approaches and then explain how they reach, they lead to different kinds of outcomes um, in particular types of cases. So uh, let's start with conceptual evolution. When I went to law school, conceptual uh, uh, evolution was the principal approach that was used to interpret the constitution. So the, as I mentioned earlier, under this approach, the primary focus of interpretation is to identify the values that underlie provisions like the due process clause or the equal protection clause, and then to further those values as you apply them in a particular case. Um, so from this perspective, the Constitution is not just a legal document, it's also aspirational. It sets forth goals for a just society and establishes broad principles that are intended to produce that kind of a just society, but nobody knew and nobody pretended to know exactly what that would be. So it would be uh, uh, appropriate under this perspective to seek to perfect those values as you interpret and apply the constitution uh, over time. And this approach really focuses on the idea that we have broad language, majestic provisions, um, and so the goal ought to be to figure out what were the framers trying to accomplish when they adopted these kinds of provisions. Um, and then we should interpret and apply the terms in order to further those values. Now, critically, um, society's values evolve over time. And so from this perspective, uh, you would seek to understand the core values, but you would apply them in light of modern sensibilities or sensitivities. Um, and for that perspective, rights that might not have been seen as important in 1789 may be understood today as being much more important. Does that make sense to everybody, right? Um, and so conceptual evolution um, is what gives us uh, some of the more uh, uh, removed ideas, ideas that are more removed from the actual text or history of the Constitution. Um, and through most of the second half of the 20th century, this was the dominant approach. Um, and it was generally associated with what we might call liberal outcomes, the Warren Court, for those of you that remember those days, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So a great example of that is the so-called right of privacy. Uh, now there's nothing in the constitution that specifically mentions any right of privacy, um, but through the latter part of the 20th century, the court began to see that the concept of liberty incorporated basic concepts of, as the court put it, the right to be left alone, which then translated into the right of privacy. And that right came to encompass a variety of interests, uh, interests like the right of people to marry, uh, the right of parents to control uh, the custody, care, education of their children. Um, and then uh, ultimately that was the source of rights like a right to contraception, a right to abortion, and more recently a right of same-sex couples to marry. Um, so um, just to put it into a recent controversial area, that's how we get Roe versus Wade in the 1970s, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and then same-sex marriage rights in uh, Obergefell. All of these cases are drawing on the concept, the core value of liberty as expressed in the due process clause, um, but they're understanding what that means, not as it was understood in 1789, but as it is understood today. Uh, and so that is essentially how uh, conceptual evolution works. 
Now, um, over time, there came to be a very powerful conservative critique of this sort of conceptual evolution. Um, from this perspective, the court wasn't interpreting the Constitution at all. The justices were simply deciding what they thought was important, calling it constitutional law, and then imposing it on the country. And from this perspective, that kind of action would be fundamentally illegitimate. The, the nine Supreme Court justices aren't elected. They're not democratically accountable. They're not selected to make policy. And if the Supreme Court is deciding values for the entire country, uh, that's arguably illegitimate. Um, another critique is the idea that um, there's no objective way to determine what those values mean, how they apply in any given set of circumstances. So it's not really possible to say what's the right answer, what's the correct answer in this kind of situation. Um, and the judges are essentially unconstrained by any uh, objective measurement of what the, what's correct as a matter of interpretation. So from the conservative perspective, the objective evidence of law is the text of the Constitution, and the goal and the focus of interpretation ought to be on the meaning of the text, not on the judge's views of the underlying values that the text may reflect. And so uh, the conservative critique gave rise to and was reflective of what is known as originalist interpretation. So uh, from an originalist perspective, the goal of constitutional interpretation is to determine the meaning of the text, the words in the constitution at the time those words were adopted. Um, and this uh, argument really begins with the idea that the legitimacy of the constitution rests on its adoption in 1789. So that's what gives it legal force. That's what makes it binding law. And therefore the right question to ask is what did people understand that to mean at the time? Because that's what they voted to legitimate, make binding fundamental law. Um, so uh, uh, from that perspective, um, we should be looking at the historical record to understand the meaning of the text. Now, I don't know how much you would care about this. Within originalism, there's a sort of division. Some, uh, some originalists say the goal should be to determine the intent of the drafters of the Constitution at the time it was written, original intent. Um, and then others say, no, the right question is, what did people think it meant? at the time they voted for it. That's known as original public meaning. So the focus of the question is a little bit different, but the time that you're looking at is the same. If you're looking at the original constitution, you care about what it meant in 1789. If you're looking at the 14th amendment, your question is what did it mean in the 1860s and 1870s? Um, so from this perspective, if you want to interpret the Constitution correctly, you look at the historical documents that surround the Constitution and its adoption, debates around the ratification, the Federalist papers that were explaining the Constitution to the public that would be voting on it. And you would also look at what was the practice under the Constitution in 1790 in 1800, in 1810, because that uh, early practice tells us something about what the drafters of the Constitution thought it meant. Okay, so um, this approach gained ascendancy um, in the 21st century. I mean, it was starting to gain ascendancy by the end of the 20th century, but with uh, additional appointments uh, in the aughts, and then more recently by President Trump, there's now a clear majority of justices that have embraced uh, originalism as the proper interpretive method. 
Um, now, it turns out just like uh, uh, evolu conceptual evolution uh, sort of produces liberal outcomes, uh, uh, originalism tends to produce conservative outcomes because it's looking back historically at historical practices. So, for example, when conservatives want to determine whether a right is protected by the Constitution, uh, they don't ask what's the underlying value of the due process clause and how do we apply that today? They ask, um, what was the historical understanding of the rights that were protected under the due process clause as evidenced by the law as it was uh, adopted in the in the aftermath uh, of the Constitution? Um, so from this perspective, um, the conservatives would say no to abortion rights and yes to gun rights. That and, and you might have noticed that's what happened, right? Um, in, in, in recent decisions. Now, just like conservatives had critiques of the liberal approach, liberals have critiques of the conservative approach. Um, and uh, these critiques include the basic idea that modern government should not be controlled by what people thought in the 18th century. Um, times have changed, attitudes have changed, the world has changed. Um, and we can maybe add to that, um, it may be that the ratification in 1789 is a key event, but I personally don't know anybody who ratified, who voted for the Constitution. Um, and uh, none of us in this room had the opportunity to approve the Constitution in 1789, did we? I, at least I, I, I didn't. Um, and, and so, you know, we might ask the question, why are we today bound by a constitution that was adopted in 1789, by the way, by a very limited component of the population, propertied white men, right? No women, no uh, African-Americans or slaves, people without property, all these people were excluded. So uh, the argument might be, well, what makes the constitution binding today is not that it was adopted in 1789, but that people today accept it as the valid social contract that governs our behavior, well, that might justify understanding the Constitution today rather than understanding it in 1789. Um, an, a, another kind of interesting conundrum for uh, originalism is um, if you are interpreting the Constitution according to what people thought in 1789, you might ask, well, what did people think about how the Constitution would be interpreted in 1789? Did they understand that the Constitution would be interpreted as a fixed meaning in 1789? Or did they understand that the Constitution's meaning would evolve over time? And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they understood that the Constitution was an evolutionary document so that if you are really uh, following the original meaning of the Constitution, you would reject originalism as uh, an argument uh, for the proper way of interpreting. Um, another big problem, and this is my, my undergraduate work was in the area of history. And, and one of the things that I learned as a historian was uh, that history is in the eye of the beholder. Um, uh, now, my, my father was a psychiatrist, so I remember uh, Rorschach tests, ink plots, um, and uh, the whole premise of an ink plot test is that people tend to see in the ink plot that which they bring with them. Um, and I think of history in the same way. It's a big ink plot, and people tend to see in history that which they bring with them. And so, uh, you know, history is not always that clear. It doesn't always tell us exactly what we, we understood or understand. And in fact, uh, on the right to bear arms, historians uh, are in disagreement about uh, whether the right to bear arms was limited to well-regulated militias or was intended to create an individual right to bear arms. 
And uh, so the Supreme Court is, it, they're not historians, they're lawyers. Um, and they're sort of going down a road, the argument would go, that in, in which they're purporting to be the final arbiters of history when they lack the training and when no one really knows what history held anyway. Um, so th those are the two principal approaches to interpretation. Um, I think both of them have arguments uh, in their favor. Both of them are vulnerable to fairly serious criticisms, and both of them can be abused by judges and justices to achieve their desired results, uh, rather than sort of calling the balls and strikes, as I think Chief Justice Roberts put it in his nomination. Uh, they are actually making law and making things up as they go along, but that's true really of both methods of interpretation. Um, and so I thought as a final uh, point before I open the floor up to questions, it, it might be useful to just think about how methodology has fed into two high profile recent cases that you may have heard of. One of them is the Dobbs case involving the right to an abortion. And the other is the Brune case, which struck down um, a New York law that limited uh, the right to carry firearms as a violation of the Second Amendment. So from the perspective of conceptual evolution, uh, abortion rights make sense. The broad concept of liberty arguably is meant to protect the fundamental right of persons to make private decisions about things like marriage, children, intimacy. And all of these decisions should be made then without government interference. That's the idea of liberty. So even though we might not have any evidence that these rights were protected or seen as protected rights in 1789, uh, the conceptual, excuse me, I, I'm a... Uh, I'm a gesture, what, what can I say? The conceptual um, con uh, uh, of liberty, sort of we now can understand it as embracing and protecting um, uh, the rights that were not uh, present or not recognized in 1789. On the other hand, and this is what happened in Dobbs, from the perspective of original meaning, liberty could not possibly include a right to abortion because abortion was prohibited throughout most of our history. There's no evidence that due process was originally understood to protect abortion rights. So without that historical justification and pedigree, the uh, originalist perspective say courts have no business recognizing this right. Now let's turn and look at, at, at gun rights. So uh, in, in the period before the rise of originalism, uh, in a decision in Heller, uh, which was the first case to recognize an individual right to bear arms, um, the court's attitude was generally, well, you know, modern conditions are quite different from those that prevailed in the 18th century. Um, so, you know, right to muskets is one thing, right to automatic weapons would be something else entirely. Um, and there's no reg regulated militias one way or another um, and anymore. So from the conceptual perspective, any kind of right to possess or carry a weapon um, has to give way to uh, legitimate health and safety concerns um, and the right of the government to regulate uh, on behalf of the public because the framers couldn't have wanted people to be killed down and uh, gunned down in mass shootings. Um, on the other hand, um, from the uh, historical perspective, um, uh, Brun says, well, the Second Amendment was understood to protect the right of individuals to own and carry weapons. And that means only regulations that were historically accepted in 1789 are valid. Everything else is prohibited by the text of the Second Amendment, which creates a, a right to carry, uh, uh, keep and, and possess arms. So um, both of these outcomes are the result of the court's shift from a conceptual evolution approach to interpretation, 
and uh, its adoption of an original public meaning approach to interpretation. So these are, uh, that's how interpretive methods then translate into concrete outcomes in high profile and controversial decisions. So that's what I have prepared in the way of remarks, and I'm happy to take questions and facilitate conversation about these issues. Can I turn on the audience microphone so that hopefully Zoom 